Uh, so yeah, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our second uh, track colloquium. So track colloquium is a part of the effort between CSAIL and Microsoft Research around trustworthy AI. So today, uh, uh, the whole session, so the, the format that we have, it's actually not uh, just talks by the speakers, it's actually more of a discussion. And actually, like the, I think the discussion is the most valuable part of what's about to happen. And you know the whole event and discussion will be uh, will be uh, <clears throat> will be governed and hosted by Emre Kitchman and Kathy Wu. So Emre Kitchman, he's a, a senior research scientist at Microsoft Research, and he works on many things, in particular on causality, which is you know very much in tune uh, with the theme of uh, today's uh, today's event. And Kathy Wu is a professor at MIT. She kind of divides her time uh, between the civil engineering, Department of Civil Engineering, IDSS, and LEADS. And she works on reinforcement learning and in general like how reinforcement learning can be applied to different uh, problems in society, in particular autonomy and mobility. So we are very excited to, you know, we have great speakers, but I will let our host to introduce them. And yeah, I'm very much lo looking forward to the event. So Emre, Kathy, please take it away. Thanks, Alexander, and welcome everyone to this uh, track colloquium. So the main topic for this colloquium is uh, the interplay between causality and reinforcement learning, and we're really excited to have really esteemed speakers today, uh, Susan Murphy and, and Jonas uh, Peters, Peters? <laughs> uh, today to uh, help lead uh, and facilitate this discussion alongside us. So. Uh, we've seen a lot of um, potential in recent years, a lot of uh, flurry of new work at the intersection of causality and reinforcement learning. And we're seeing ways that, uh, you know, one can help the other in, in sort of both directions, but it's still a very, uh, very evolving space. Um, we, we're seeing that uh, causal relationships can help us understand distribution shifts. We're seeing that, um, that there are implications on scalability, generalization, fairness, explanation, and robustness and so on. And, and we can just like probably talk for two hours about that. Uh, but instead of doing that, I'm going to uh, introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, but this is not a regular talk. This is also a discussion. So uh, get ready to engage. Um, so uh, our first speaker is uh, Susan Murphy. Uh, Susan is a professor at Harvard University in statistics and computer science. She leads the statistical reinforcement learning lab uh, there that studies uh, data analytic algorithms and methods for informing sequential decision making in health. Um, and uh, in particular, she has done a lot of work on, um, on a, a, it's called mobile, mobile health. And uh, so Dr. Murphy is, was awarded one of the uh, very rare MacArthur Genius Grants um, and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine as well as Sciences and a lot more that I cannot say. Uh, but with that, uh, so now Susan will sort of give some remarks, um, but I hope that you will all start uh, engaging through the chat or raise your hand or uh, and we'll, and we will uh, we'll sort of help facilitate this discussion with Susan uh, as well as the rest of us. Uh, all right, so Susan, I'll let you take it from there. Okay, great, great, Kathy. I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, can you see it? Can you yes. see the screen? Yep. Yep, thanks. Uh, okay, so this is uh, something that's um, really causing me, uh, uh, me a lot of trouble. Um, and we'll see, you'll see why I say that shortly. So it's about, uh, learning within, in my case, it's within an individual in terms of making sequences of decisions and between batches of individuals. And so the main uh, things I want to, let me see if, the main point, so I'm going to, I'm telling you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you about it, and then I'm going to come back to this. So uh, the first thing, uh, there's this tension between idiosyncratic learning versus building generalizable knowledge. And in RL, uh, in general, sequential decision-making, the way the field is developed, most of the focus 
uh, has been on optimizing sequential decisions for a unit, whatever defines a unit. And this is essentially idiosyncratic learning. It's not about other units. It's about we want to make the best decisions for this unit. In my case, this would be a unit would be an individual. I want to do the best I can for that individual. But in scientific research, building generalizable knowledge is absolutely critical. And the main point I'm going to make is that we've got to figure out a way to balance these two objectives in a principled fashion. And at this point, there's been little effort and often a great deal of misunderstanding about attempts to balance these two objectives. Okay, so I'll discuss them as we go through. So the test case, this is the area I work in, uh, is what we call personalized sequential decision making. And mainly I work in digital health. And, the, uh, and but this uh, problem also occurs in education. Uh, and the goal is to optimize a sequence of decisions on a unit, in my case, an individual. But it could also be your, you have a group of individuals that are very similar and you're gonna optimize for that entire group but the sequence of decisions for that entire group. This, is, uh, it, this turns out to be simultaneously both an important area of scientific research. Okay, so when I say scientific research, of course, developing new methods, algorithmic statistical methods for doing sequential decision-making, that's an area of research, scientific research. But when I say important area of scientific research, I'm talking about in the domain setting. It's an important area of scientific research, how to make good sequential decisions. It's also an important idiosyncratic problem because you wanna help that. You wanna, each person, you want them to do the best they can. The issue in this particular health, both, well, actually both digital health and education, is that these fields are like, they're on the edge. They're on the edge of the scientific frontier. And as a result, they're relatively immature. A lot of the theories are extremely qualitative. They're not quantitative. This is not about building a bridge. Uh, it's not about operating a car. It's not about flying a helicopter. There's just not a lot of domain science, quantitative domain science that can be brought to bear. In addition, in digital health, the sensor field is evolving very, very fast and new sensors come out all the time. So it's a, a, a field in which there's an enormous amount of change going on. This makes it both important in terms of advancing scientific knowledge, as well as trying to solve real problems. So um, I'm gonna focus first on the blue text at the very bottom of the screen, and then we'll go on to the other part. So what I want to do is I'm going to abstract the problem away a little bit. One abstraction I'm going to be critical of and the other less so. It, the other I'm just using as a way for me to start this discussion. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to act. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page because we need to understand what we say when we say regret minimization and why in the world would this be in conflict with uh, advancing generalizable knowledge. Uh, so I'm going to work in a classical contextual banded environment. So uh, in my case, we're always talking about sequential decisions on an individual. So there's a context space S, there's an action space script A. Uh, the context space is the, uh, a variety of sensor data from both wearables, smart devices. The action space is uh, different kinds of suggestions helping people with social support, motivational uh, cues, reminders, and so on. Then there's a distribution on that context space, it's the distribution at which the context appears. And then we have potential outcomes. Now, the word potential outcome comes straight out of causal inference. Uh, and for every possible action that could be taken, we imagine there being a potential outcome for the reward. And then the thing that makes this, the, in my mind, the classical bandit setting is this, I think you should be able to see my pointer, this uh, second to last bullet point. It's the, the ST, the, the context, and then the whole sequence of potential outcomes at that time. These are IID across time, T, okay? 
Uh, and we only, it's, it, that's complete data because we only get to observe one of those rewards and that's the reward associated with the action that was indeed selected at that time. Um, and then the last bullet point is just the notation for the conditional mean of the reward under a good given action, little a, uh, given context S. So this is all, um, so this is not overtly causal inference, but it's everything I talk about is inherently causal inference. Anytime you're doing any kind of experimentation, including sequential experimentation, you're doing causal inference. Okay, um, oops, I think I went backwards. Yeah, um, so um, what do we want to do? So I, again, I just want to remind you, I'm focusing on this last blue part. Something's wrong. Okay, so uh, thinking about how to do best for this individual. So first of all, I'll, I'll have to quantify what doing best means. So uh, what's a policy here? A policy is just a function from the set of contexts and it results and it outputs an action. Uh, there's an optimal policy and here I might operationalize this as the optimal policy is the mapping from context S from a particular context S to an action and it's the action that maximizes the conditional mean of the reward in that context S. So you, ch you, you choose to observe, you want the optimal policy specifically chooses to observe the reward that's associated with that particular action, the optimal action. Okay, so the optimal personalized decision for an individual is the action which is output by this policy, this policy that maximizes the mean of the reward conditional on being in context S at time T. So um, how do we learn that optimal policy? So online as an individual in my case is experiencing the uh, digital intervention, interacts back and forth with the wearable and the smartphone or an iPad. We explore effects of actions, that is we try, different actions are tried in each context, i.e. sequential experimentation in order to learn the optimal policy. And the natural goal here, particularly if you're interested in solving this problem for this individual, helping this individual in front of you, is to learn that optimal policy as fast as possible. And that's what it, what it means, regret minimization. It's about trying to learn the optimal policy as fast as possible and indeed is the most common approach to solving this idiosyncratic problem, trying to help this individual in front of you, in my case, an individual. So in particular, just to provide some context for regret minimization, I have some decision-making algorithm. I call it script L. At each time T, it takes the data that's available at that time. That's the history on that, in my case, on that individual up to that time. And it outputs a policy. Uh, and I put a hat on that policy because it's a function of that prior history. Now that policy is a policy. So a policy inputs state, I mean, I'm sorry, context at that time and outputs action. So the algorithm produces policies, a policy at each time. And if we think of the regret at time capital T, say after a certain number of units of time, capital T, of our decision-making algorithm compared to the best policy, the, an oracle would have selected the actions according to pi opt, the best optimal policy. Then we have this difference. And of course, the difference is always positive because uh, our algorithm, the decision-making algorithm, is working in a world in which it doesn't know everything about that individual. It may not know uh, exactly how, it may not know the form of the reward, the conditional mean of the reward given uh, context in action. Ideally, this algorithm should minimize the regret, I, uh, regret minimization, that's the idea. So each time you would want that algorithm to the best of your ability, you'd want to devise an algorithm which would minimize that regret. So again, I just want to comment on area of scientific research is methods for constructing sequential decision-making algorithms. That's great. My 
point here is that this area, when you start to get into the, to the field of digital health and education, it's somewhat misguided. It's targeting the wrong thing, i.e. solely regret minimization. So what are some of the consequences of minimizing the regret or att you know, attempting, uh, attempting to devise a decision-making algorithm that should lead to minimal regret? The two big consequences, which seem so innocuous, one is you have this gross undersampling of actions in context in which, at least according to the data, they appear non-optimal. And when you're, in your, when you're in a setting where multiple actions may be approximately or equally useful, the, uh, the policy that's being output by the uh, decision-making algorithm, it doesn't concentrate, it doesn't converge. And it makes perfect sense because it can't decide, you know, neither action, maybe you have two actions that are equally useful, which action can, you know, you don't know which one and it just may flip flop between the two. Again, that seems totally innocuous. Certainly this is not going to impact the regret. I mean, we're still able to impact the regret. And these are in fact are consequences of trying to minimize the regret. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to this problem that I'm interested in, digital health, education as well as very similar online education. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, these are areas in which uh, the domain science is right on the edge of the frontier of scientific discovery. So these are areas in which you not only have to solve important idiosyncratic problems, you also have to, or you need to be able to contribute to science, you need to do scientific research as well. We're not building a bridge or an overpass. Uh, so this gets us to this idea of generalizable knowledge. And I think this fits in with Jonas's talk that's gonna, that'll come next. At least I view this uh, as fitting in. Uh, so um, much of science is about building generalizable knowledge. So this is knowledge that you can stably, that stably transfers from one setting to the next. And from a practical engineering kind of perspective, it provides a head start for me, an initialization for me when I have to confront a new setting or when the setting changes. So I'm interested in generalizable knowledge just from an engineering perspective, but in general, it, it helps us uh, transfer information across different settings maybe across different individuals, across individuals of different educational backgrounds, individuals who live in different countries, what can you translate? Individuals who live in different states in the US who have different income levels. This knowledge also, this generalizable knowledge should give us insight into un underlying causal structure. And that's really a very big deal in the behavioral sciences which underpin digital health. And indeed the actions are specifically, the selection of the actions are directly related to the way they think the causal structure can be manipulated, how you might manipulate it. So going back to those two a sequela of uh, regret minimization. Uh, the first is that the policy that I use at time T, that's the output of my uh, decision-making algorithm, it grossly undersamples apparently non-optimal actions. This is highly problematic. So if you want to build generalizable knowledge about some, say a population of similar individuals, maybe you want to use different outcomes than the reward. You might want to consider different policies with the same outcome. You might be thinking that in a certain context, there's a new action out there that you didn't have available during the current round, and you might be able to bring it in, and you want to think about, well, how did the current actions work compare in that particular context? So this is all about off-policy learning, and that has a rich history in the RL community. And generally, this assumes that uh, the uh, regret the uh, decision-making algorithm is outputting policies that are stochastic 
And most importantly, their probabilities are bounded away from zero and one. Uh, and, and operationally, this means you're, you have importance weights. You can use importance weights that are bounded or, sta or stable. Uh, also, it's related to uh, causal excursion effects. And so causal excursion effects, all they are is a mixture between uh, online learning and off policy. They're just saying at each time, at any given time, if I deviate from the current policy and I choose to follow maybe one of three future policies in going forward from this point in time, how might my rewards vary? So they're like, what if questions? If I should change the current policy uh, in one of three ways, how do these three contrast with each other? In all of these cases, if your uh, decision-making algorithm outputs a policy that grossly undersamples apparently non, I mean, and possibly you have so much signal that they are non-optimal actions, but this precludes all kinds of off-policy learning, particularly with different kinds of outcomes. And usually one has quite a, a, a large number of outcomes in these settings. Um, another aspect of whether or not regret minimization, a sequela of regret minimization, is that um, that policy that's output by the decision-making algorithm if you have uh, actions in a particular context that are relatively, uh, they're uh, equivalently optimal, then that uh, policy doesn't converge. Here, there's another, and this is more about generalizable knowledge for this particular unit. So we have to, we want to, uh, we may have a particular individual in front of us and we want to help them over five, eight years. So you want to think, or it may be a group of individuals form your unit. Uh, and then you want, you might ask, well, uh, simple questions even, what's a confidence interval for the treatment effect? Uh, and there's been work in this area. It's another area of uh, a good bit of interest in the um, RL community. And then there's also, it, from my perspective, uh, uh, on this unit or this, in my case, this individual, how might uh, this, uh, individual might change if they have, uh, if I consider different outcomes or different covariates, different context, contextual variables. And uh, so some of the outcomes may be binary, whereas the reward was continuous. I want to ask questions about what's the relative effect of the actions for this binary outcome when before all I had, my, the way I ran the study was with a continuous reward. And so it's generalizable. There's a generalizable knowledge for the greater population or subpopulation of individuals. There's also generalizable into the future for the units that you have on hand. So um, developing experimental designs, that is decision, that's what decision-making algorithms are in this learning type setting that are optimized to solve one problem. I mean, this is and, and usually in RL, it's some notion of regret minimization, is a lot of fun, it's, it's interesting, but is it useful when you get to the scientific domain? Is it useful in scientific research? If you implement these algorithms, so this is something I'm extremely interested in, is how do we ensure or enable their implementation by large healthcare, in my case, large healthcare set, uh, systems, then we have to have a way to monitor these algorithms and we have to be able to change them and ask what if questions. Um, these real life implementations. So if I use a real life implementation of a solution uh, that was all about regret minimization, I'm going to waste a lot. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, so I think our new goal should be to balance personalization. I've used the word personalization because I'm really interested in learning within an individual. That is within individual optimization of sequential decisions. With other demands, uh, these other demands have to be quantified in some way, but we need to balance personalization with contributing to generalizable knowledge, both for that individual in future when other sensors might be available or when other actions might be around, uh, also to facilitate transfer to other settings. 
Uh, and in the real life implementation, it becomes even more critical. How do you, you need to facilitate monitoring of these decision-making algorithms. You need to facilitate processes for updating as new sensors come in and so on. How do we do this? Oh, I think I lied. This is my second to last go. So uh, here's my, I mean, second last, here's my last slide. Uh, should we change the definition of an optimal policy? And it has to be changed. Okay, we can always do constrained optimization. I'm totally with you. But I cannot tell you the list of constraints up front often. Maybe I can tell you one, but not all of them. Uh, the optimal policy should facilitate analyses that contribute to generalizable knowledge. So how do you define an optimal policy that does that? How do you mathematize that? They should allow for real life messiness in implementation so that we can say that when a big healthcare system rolls this out, they're gonna be using, they're gonna be attempting to get the optimal policy. What constitutes an optimal policy for this balancing? Uh, and of course, anybody that works in real RL problems, uh, I mean, in, in actual um, life type settings like artificial limbs, uh, digital health, education, these are inherently all non-stationary problems. So uh, we want to always continually learn. Any, I, and I'm looking for ideas, other ideas for how we can uh, attack this type of problem. Thanks. Thank you so much, Susan. You're welcome. Uh, so I think we can maybe take a few questions now, uh, maybe that are more specific to Susan's talk and uh, also get the conversation going and then we'll go to Jonas and then we'll come back together uh, with a discussion uh, for with everyone. So uh, while folks are uh, uh, putting up their hands or putting their questions into the chat, uh, I have one maybe straw man question, uh -huh. which is if you think about, uh, so how much should we think about this as like regret minimization being like a like a incorrect paradigm versus that is a paradigm where you know a few hacks can maybe patch the holes. Uh, so you might be able to think about like uh, maybe with a with the uh, desiderata that you had, uh, maybe we want more exploration, and we, we can encourage that potentially by adding a term to the reward function and. Uh, and potentially the same true for maybe if there are multiple optimal actions, maybe uh, you know maybe there's some benefit in 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 choosing one uh, because humans like that or something. And so, uh, what do you what is your what is your take on on that? Yeah. So my current approach is to do the hacks. Okay. And I find that incredibly unsatisfactory. That's not the way we do science. So I want, now I'm talking about science of forming decision-making algorithms and sequential experimentation. I want to do the science of sequential experimentation. And hacks are good, like when I have a deadline and I'm, I'm involved in a study that's going into a field, in the field and I got to have a solution ASAP, you know, I'm all, I'm all for hacks, but that's not the long-term solution. I want us to rethink about these problems. It's not, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. I had a question as well, uh, Susan. Um, you talked about how we can frame these sequential decision-making problems in a way that contributes to generalizable science and, and gives us insights into, into what's going on in a particular field. How about the other direction? As we, as we learn about the mechanisms that are in, involved in you know, decision-making in a particular context mm -hmm. for, for, for health medicine, for example, how do we frame, what, what do you think is the right way to start framing the, 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 the bandit problem to bring in that uh, prior knowledge? Yeah, so we pretty much only do Bayesian work. So, and our priors are not all, all informative priors. So they're coming, normally there is some trial that was run that was, uh, had a lot more exploration and we use the data from that trial. Now that never really fits the bill because now you have to bring in, like there may be some new sensor that came in on the market or all of a sudden uh, more structural uh, 
work has indicated that you should be collecting a different kind of observation that you weren't collecting in the first round. And so you have to set the priors for that. But I like that. I, and I actually, in this setting, in digital health, it's even more important. You really want prior, it's they're very noisy settings and you're gonna learn very slowly. So you try really hard to form a good prior uh, in order to speak. I view priors as initialization, smart initialization. Because the bad prior, uh, as long as it doesn't exclude actions in certain contexts, doesn't prevent learning. You just learn slower. So to me, this is, in fact, every trial for me is about building the prior for the next one. That's to me one way to transfer knowledge. Yeah. Thanks. So, so we do have one question in, the, in our Q&A. Uh, so uh -huh. Susan mentioned that generalizable science uh, as different kinds of transfer we'd like to do. For example, new sensors come in online, new actions become available. Do we have a language to describe the kinds of generalizations or transfer or robustness to changes that we want? I, I was trying to do, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Jonas may have a better answer to this question when he gives his talk. Um, with me, it's more about like, I, often people after these studies are over, they wanna do mediational analyses. They'll draw directed acyclic graphs like dynamic graphs and they want to fit those kinds of graphs with very different outcomes uh, to the data and I want to ensure that they can still do that. Um, so I don't, I, it's learning the causal structure or at least trying to and you're fortunate because this is a setting where you're actually manipulating. There's real do's here. It's not fake, right? It's not like I'm pretending I have a do. I actually have them particularly if I'm using posterior sampling, which is a, ran a sequential randomization. So I don't have a good one name fits all, but I call it generalizable knowledge. Yeah. Actually, that's what IRBs, when you do human subject studies, which is what I do, you have to, you only have to go to the IRB if you're attempting to do research to enlarge, uh, generalizable knowledge, to contribute to generalizable knowledge. So that's where that phrase comes from. Oh, wow. Yeah. If you Google it, you'll see. OK, good. So uh, I think this is a good start. And I think now we can move to uh, Jonas. And I think Emre uh, will introduce him. Sure. Hi, my name is Emre Kujiman. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Jonas Peters. Uh, professor Peters is a professor of statistics at the University of Copenhagen. He is um, well known for his work in causality and uh, computational statistics and robustness. He is one of the authors of the elements of causal inference. Um, before, uh, before he uh, uh, was at the University of uh, uh, Copenhagen. He was uh, leading the causality group at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen uh, and was a Marie, Marie Curie fellow at the Seminar for Statistics at ETH Zurich before that. Um, it's uh, my pleasure. I'll hand it over to, uh, to you, uh, Jonas, for the second talk in our colloquium. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the kind words and the invitation. Thanks a lot, Susan, for the great talk. Uh, many interesting points, I think. Um, I'm also sharing my screen and then we'll see whether there's anything to it. Okay, I hope you can hear me okay, otherwise just complain. Um, so as you said, my, my background is more on the causality side and um, here both in the panel and among the attendees uh, are many people who know much more about reinforcement learning than I do. Uh, so I really view this also as a way of hopefully getting some, uh, some feedback and input, uh, comments, thoughts, and uh, maybe also some relevant references. Um, I'm going to try to keep this uh, also a bit of a, on the general level and then show you a couple of concrete ideas. Uh, and the concrete ideas I wanted to uh, discuss, uh, this is joint work with um, uh, three wonderful people. 
two PhD students, Nikolai and Sobavit, uh, and uh, Niklas, who's an assistant professor. All of them are also here in uh, Copenhagen. Okay, so the, the first question is uh, causality, why should we care? Uh, and I would like to start uh, with a couple of uh, thoughts from the IAD world, and then uh, we're going to see whether we can transfer them um, into the reinforcement learning setting. Um, and I should say that here the uh, generalizability, we will look at one, but it's a, it's a bit of a specific one. And so I, I'd like to keep up that discussion uh, if people are interested also afterwards. Okay, so Susan already mentioned a couple of reasons why we should care about causality. Uh, in this talk, I want to focus on one, and this is uh, re related to this robustness question. So we, we start with a response variable, again, now in the IAD setting, but we we'll, can already think about the reinforcement learning setting. So we have a response variable Y, we have a couple of covariates X, and then we are receiving data from one model, let's call it M. Um, and now what do we want? We want to learn a prediction model, but one that doesn't necessarily perform well in the uh, training data, but that performs well on some test data that potentially may be different. Now, there are different ways of, uh, of looking at this problem, uh, uh, domain generalization, out of distribution prediction, covariate shift. Uh, there's a lot of work on it. Here, we want to bring in the causality point of view. Uh, so why would you ever then look at a, cause, a causal model? The point is that if you say that the test distribution comes from the training distribution by certain interventions, then you can say that the causal model is minimax optimal in the following sense. So if you look at arbitrary interventions on the covariates, and now you sort of look at the worst case, then the causal model is really the best thing that you can do. So let's write this down. This is less complicated than it maybe looks. So here we're just looking at the, um, at the mean squared error on the right-hand side, so f uh, square is our predictor. And now we are looking at the mean squared error not in the training data, but at some under some interventions. And now if we are looking at the worst case um, and try to minimize this, then what we end up with is the, is the causal function. Um, how can we view this? What's the intuition behind this? So imagine that you have a response y and you have one cause and one effect. Now, if you're just caring for prediction, then uh, you can, of course, include x1 and x2, and you get the best predictive model. However, if you, for example, base your prediction on x2, and then in, in the test, the mechanism, how x2 is generated from y changes, so we call this an intervention on x2, then you m might be fooled because uh, taking into account x2 in the way you did, uh, because you learned in the training data, might be actually a very bad way of doing it. And then you might end up with a very large uh, prediction error. So this is the idea why causality could maybe help to, to address this problem. Uh, but then, of course, in reality, we never know the, the, the causal structure. So what do we do? And now there's one uh, simple idea that um, uh, in the re recent years uh, we tried to exploit a bit. Uh, and this is based on a very simple observation, namely saying, well, if now you don't have one training data um, that you can learn your model from, but you have several, uh, and um, maybe we can think about uh, different patients, but we should discuss whether our assumptions make sense there. Uh, but if you have several, then what you can check already is whether if you're training a model, whether this is actually invariant over these different, what we call environments or th these different patients. Because if it's not, then we can already say, well, then this cannot be a causal model. This is a, in, in short terms, this is sort of an underlying idea you can try to exploit. So the idea is, invariant models, so if you check whether models are invariant with respect to different uh, environments that you observe, uh, these are the models that are potentially causal. Maybe not, but these are the potential causal models. Just one example to make this a bit more concrete. So um, maybe you want to regress Y on X2 and you have two environments, uh, orange and blue environment, um, and you see that the regression coefficients are actually quite different in these two environments, then you know, okay, this cannot possibly be a causal model. What is the underlying uh, sort of intuition that we may have? So if this is how the data were generated, so we have again this x1 causing, x, uh, causing y causing x2, and the, the environment represented by a square e here sort of influencing both, then what you would see is that, aha, indeed, it, if I regress y on x2, it could be that I already see a, 
sort of a non-invariance in the data. And then this tells me, well, I don't have uh, a, a causal model. If you like graphical models, one way of thinking about this is to say, well, you have, if you regress on y, this conditional y given x2, this is not invariant. It depends on the environment E, and you can actually read this off from the graph. Whereas if you look at the causal model, y given x1, then this is really invariant. This is always the same conditional uh, depending on ch changing environments. And again, the, uh, the reasoning would now be to say, we, we try to exploit these sort of this relation between invariance and causal models in order to look for invariant models and then hopefully come closer to a causal model. And these can maybe generalize better to unseen uh, environments. This is, this is sort of the, the reasoning that we have seen in the last uh, years of it. There are different ways of uh, exploiting this. Um, we looked at something that is, is called invariant causal prediction. I don't go into details here, just to get, uh, give maybe an idea of what is this heterogeneity, because this, we, this connects to this question earlier. What is the heterogeneity we are looking at? So you can try to look at invariances over discrete environments. Uh, so think about a blue and an orange data set. Uh, you can also look at invariances over time and so on. And there's nothing uh, linear of this idea. So there are a couple of ways of uh, uh, sort of generalizing this. But th this is sort of one idea that, that we exploited in this IRD world. Now, once more, so if we focus on prediction, I like this knob a lot. Uh, so if we focus on prediction, then we can say this is a, a very a reasonable way to do if we believe that our test distribution is the same as the training distribution. Uh, so then this is the optimal thing to say and to do. And also I would argue, um, forget about causality. We, we just look at the best predictive model. Now, what I try to argue in the last minutes is, well, if you turn the knob towards invariance, then you can hope to get closer to a causal model. And this is sort of the best, in this mini max sense uh, shown below, this is the best thing you can do um, if you are trying to guard yourself against arbitrary strong intervention on the covariates. The obvious Jonas, we question have is- a, We have a clarification question. Yeah, um, sure. Thanks. So the question uh, from Adith is, is there an implicit assumption of realizability for this line of reasoning? I'm guessing this is referring to the invariant prediction uh, line of reasoning, uh, um, that the causal model F belongs in a set of functions F uh, that we are searching over. Does yes. this insight hold even for uh, non-realizable causes, for example, due to partial observability of all causes of Y? Yeah, that's a very good a good point. Let me come back to this uh, later, if that's OK. okay. It's, a, it's a good question. So, But for now, let's assume it's realizable. So the, the function really lies in this uh, function class f. You can, you can generalize these statements a bit. But for now, let's assume it's realizable. Now, one question is, well, what, can we, what happens if we, if we so, sort of look at things in between? So if we turn the knob in the middle, uh, so what do we get then? The, the hope or the intuition is, that well, maybe looking for these causal functions a bit conservative in the sense that well, these arbitrary strong interventions, we don't expect them to happen. So of course we have a certain uh, similarity between these environments or patients, but whatever you want to, uh, to think about. And then we don't want to guard ourselves against arbitrary strong interventions. There are many things to say about this. I will not say to say much, maybe just two, two words. So you can analyze this theoretically a bit um, so you can actually get, if you balance, if you trade off the prediction and the invariance, you get um, solutions that you can characterize by saying that they are optimal in this minimax sense against a bounded set of interventions. So you are indeed, again, get an optimality statement, but not for, not for arbitrary strong interventions, but for uh, interventions with, uh, with uh, bounded strength. So you can, one can try to analyze this a bit. The second comment is, how would this ever be useful in, in practice? And this is just a thought that I would like to uh, also see whether one can exploit this in reinforcement learning, but we just don't know. This other idea is to say that, well, if you trade off predictability on, and invariance, this is a bit like a regularization. So we are, of course, very well aware of, uh, say, say Lasso or rich regression, where we are penalizing a large norm of the, let's say, regression coefficients. Now here you can do something similar, but you're not using this norm, but you're saying non, I want to penalize with non-invariance. Um, and this is in particular useful in settings where, um, for example, the parameters, you, you cannot put them on the same scale, which you would need to do, of course, in Lasso. 
um, for example, in differential equation models. So they, they are these type of regularization schemes seem, uh, seem to become useful. Okay, so now this is the, the world, a well, long introduction of the IID uh, world. And now I would like to at least think a bit about what, to which extent can we exploit this also in reinforcement learning. I'll skip this. Um, the short answer is, well, we don't know. Um, so what we did instead is we looked at a simpler problem uh, and uh, a problem that also Susan mentioned in her talk. We looked a bit into this uh, contextual bandits. And there, of course, we also don't know the full answer, but uh, I wanted to share a couple of thoughts that we had um, over the last months when we, we looked at this problem. Um, again, the hope is maybe we find something that uh, we can exploit these invariance and causality ideas to find a solution, a policy that generalizes a bit better. And now I'm, uh, I, I show you the, the formalization of this and you, you see that this is a quite restrictive uh, problem that we're looking at. So we again consider a set of environments. Again, it can be, it can be a thing about the discrete uh, setting for now. And we, we assume that the, the reward mechanism doesn't change. And here you see this is a restricted setting. And I like some of the thoughts uh, Susan said, um, and they are not included here. So this is one attempt to sort of make maybe a tiny step, uh, step forwards. But I definitely think these, these other types of generalizations are quite uh, important to look at, I can imagine. I mean, I don't have as much experience with real world data than many of you have in, in reinforcement learning. Now, what is the goal? Um, so you can ask for a similar goal. Um, and here, we are also looking at uh, regrets, uh, but it would be nice to think about whether we can uh, generalize this. Um, what are we looking at? We are looking at for a given policy pi at the expected reward in a certain environment E. And now again, we are looking at a worst case. So we're looking at the worst case uh, expected reward over the environments. And this we want to maximize. So we want to, again, optimize the, the worst case behavior of our, of all our, of our policy. And this uh, thing here, we just call VE of pi. So this is a, the idea as in the IID setting. And now first, one example why there might be hope. So this is a simulation setting. I forgot about the formulas on the bottom left. I think they're not needed. This is a scenario that you may have in mind on the bottom right. So we have a, this is a very simple setting now. We have an, a reward um, that depends on some of our covariates. Uh, let's say on X2 in this case, we have the action. And this, this is chosen by a policy pi. The variable U is assumed to be um, hidden. Now, what you see here is um, the result on uh, the following problem. So you're given a training data set, and then you are trying to learn the best policy that takes into account x2. This is a policy uh, like the one here, pi. And you're comparing this against the best policy you can get if you include x1 and x2. And then we are evaluating this on a test environment, so on an environment that looks a bit different than the training environment. Um, and then what we plot is the regret uh, on the y-axis. And what you see on the x-axis is just to say how different are the test environments that we, um, uh, we check the policies on from the training environment. And you see indeed that um, there seems to be one environment or one policy, sorry, uh, this orange one that seems to uh, get at least in some cases much larger regrets uh, than the blue one. And the blue one seems to be bounded. Uh, so indeed, this is hope that there might be uh, some of these minimax results also in reinforcement learning. Let's look at this, this problem um, at, this, um, at this example once more. What you see is that there's this hidden, hidden variable, this confounder uh, that is influencing both x1 and r, the rewards. And it turns out that this is not a surprise that this uh, hidden common cause, hidden confounder exists because what you can show and this relates to this comment from Susan that we are actually, we are sort of doing the do interventions. So we are actively, um, this, is, this is depending on the setting that we are looking at in, in contextual bandits. If there's no confounder, there's nothing you can gain with causality or invariance. So this is a, a statement that you can prove. So if there's no hidden common cause like the U, so if you observe everything, then at least in this setup, you don't have to worry about causality. Uh, you just can pool all the environments that you have and you uh, find a, a policy that is uh, that satisfies this invariance. So in this sense, it's not an ex 
uh, it's not a coincidence that um, um, you see an example here where you have a confounder because if there's not, there's actually nothing uh, that we can gain. So you can make this formal. I'm not going into the details uh, here. Um, however, this, this means, I think, that when we see sort of works where we are trying to, to exploit invariants where there are no confounders, we should double check what's going on because at least from our point of view, um, there's nothing to gain. However, so however, if there's a confounder, we may want to try to find these uh, these invariant policies, um, this 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 blue one. So let's see what's going on. So again, as in the IID world, we can say that this policy pi that only depends on x two rather than x one and x two this satisfies an invariant statement. So what is the invariant statement? So we are saying a policy pi is invariant with respect to a set S if and only if we have that the expected reward given the X doesn't change. And this is the case here for uh, the blue policy. So the expected reward doesn't depend on the environment uh, if I condition on the, on the X. This is, a, this is one way you may define uh, an invariant policy. Again, what do we think about? If you like graphical models, you think about that the reward given the XS, this is independent of E. So this conditional doesn't change on E. Here we are looking at uh, expectations, which makes things a bit more technically challenging, but I, the intuition is fine, I think. And indeed, this policy pi that only depends on two satisfies this invariance. So this is something that we, if you like graphical models, it's not so surprising. So you can just read this off uh, from the graph. So that indeed here, x2 satisfies this, uh, this uh, invariance if you let your policy depend only on x2. You can prove that indeed uh, the, the simulation results that um, we saw before doesn't come then as a surprise because you can show that whenever you, um, you base your policy under, uh, on such an invariant policy, then you're guaranteed to perform at least as good as if you uh, choose a non-invariant policy. So let's just quickly go through this. We need two assumptions, I skip for now, but you have these observational environments. And now if you are looking at uh, this blue policy that is um, sort of trying to optimize the worst case among the observed environments uh, over the invariant policies, then you are always better than if you try to look at um, non-invariant policies and then try to optimize the worst case performance uh, over the observed environments there. So this is exactly what we saw in the simulation. Um, why? Because the blue one is an in invariant policy and the orange one is a non-invariant policy. So if we have x1 and x2 going into this, this graph, then indeed the invariance is not satisfied. The details here don't matter that much, but this is what we saw, right? So the blue, uh, the blue and uh, sort of the blue policy is bounded, as you can see here, um, whereas the orange one, uh, the non-invariant one, there you cannot get any bound on the on the possible regret. This is a tiny, so this is a tiny step, I would say, into this direction of saying that maybe these invariances over observed environments can, like in the IID case, um, help us or guard uh, ourselves, or uh, maybe show ourselves like in which directions to look for, for these um, policies that may generalize well. Now there's one last um, comment I want to, to say uh, before, I, uh, before I close. And this is that if you look at these statements, um, then what you see is that these depend on the policy. And this is, I think, a, a key difference to the IID world. Um, because what we are now doing is we are, of course, changing the data generating process all the time because we are considering different policies. So what we are looking at, we are looking at statements um, in different distributions. So here, conditional independencies, for example, but under different distributions. So for example, if you look at this pi tilde policy and now try to find this, this uh, blue condition independence or check it, then it just doesn't hold because this is a statement that depends on the policy. So what goes into the policy? Whereas if you look, have this, this orange policy pi tilde, then actually this condition independence doesn't hold. So what does this mean? This means that we need, in order to answer these questions, for example, for, of invariance, we need statistical testing under distributional shifts. 
So we may have one training date or one observational data set. And now we want to answer questions like invariance, like condition independence about a different distribution. So we may have sampled from pi tilde, this orange one, but we are interested in making statements about the blue one. So what we need is statistical testing under these distributional shifts. And so we think that this is actually, um, uh, this is a key point if you want to address these type of questions uh, in the reinforcement uh, uh, learning uh, setups. So um, uh, before you move on, could you clarify yeah. again why uh, the uh, conditioning on X12, uh, basically your, your second to last line, like why? Yes, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks. I wasn't very clear on this. Huh? This is because of the, the confounder. So if you look at, I guess I understand the question is, why is the second to last line correct? And if you're looking at this orange policy, what happens is that if you condition on X1, you're opening this path via the uh, hidden variable. So then suddenly the E is not independent of R anymore because you're opening this path over the confounder. This is, by the way, if you feel comfortable with these statements, this is also giving you a hint that the problem really comes from the hidden variables. Um, this cannot happen. This is basically the result I mentioned if you have uh, everything observed. Okay, and if I may, I, I just want to say maybe two or three minutes how to do the statistical testing under distributional shifts. Um, it's surprisingly easy, um, but we believe it's it's a quite a useful oh, concept. So if I may, I, I'll just share this and then I close. What do we oh, want to no. test? So we are given an observed data set from a distribution, let's call it Q. We are interested in a different distribution, namely P. And we're interested in a hypothesis, let's say this invariance or condition independence. Now, there is a relationship between them and think about the one distribution, we are changing the policy. So this I think works as a motivation, I hope. So now there's a, I, I hear, can, can hear some background noise, but maybe that's, that's okay. Yeah, it's gone now. So the, 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 these two we're, distributions, we're they are muting. related. We're working on muting. Uh, just okay, that's continue. fine. Yeah. Okay, I, I'll try again. So these these two distributions, they are um, related by a transformation tau. And this can be, and these are the weights that you uh, have an in importance weighting, uh, for example. So just make this more concrete. You have a distribution you're interested in. Uh, this is using the, let's say, the blue policy, and you have data from a system where you have used the orange policy. How do you transform one to the other? Well, you just introduce these weights that we know all the time and that we, of course, use for importance, uh, let's say, inverse probability weighting or um, Howard Thompson, so all these estimators uh, that we know. Now, what we are interested in is whether this other distribution that we don't have data from satisfies a null hypothesis. For example, invariance. And then what does it mean to have point as asymptotic level? There's nothing new here. It just says, well, if the observed distribution Q is such that tau of Q really satisfies this null hypothesis, then I want to reject only with a small probability. So this is a very natural way of, of defining the, the level. And now the interesting point is, at, at least for us, is that this is very simple. These things are very simple to test for. Um, so why? So, but we of course use, if you're interested in estimating the expected reward, we are doing this all the time, then you're just re weighting your observations and then averaging over them. Um, however, in testing, it's a bit different because the, the test statistics may not be uh, sort of be able, to, you may not be able to write them as an expectation over single observations, but we are using the same idea with the weights, uh, but now we are just resampling from the distribution. Uh, so this you can do, you take the observation distribution, resample with these weights, and then you get a new sample, the auxiliary sample, and then you just apply a test to this uh, observed um, of this newly constructed um, uh, data sample. Let me just uh, write this down. So um, what do we do? We look at the same same weights, maybe the details you don't matter that much, but you you look at the same, same weights um, and you say that you you generate a sample and now comes a trick. You want to generate a distinct sample. So with something like without replacement, but there the, the weights are just then the, the weight, the probability of sampling a, a data set I1 to IM, 
we see resample m data points and the probability of sampling this data set is just the product of the weights. So this is very similar to this inverse probability weighting. And then if you have this, you just apply a test from the target domain uh, to the resampled data. Uh, and then you're more or less done. So you can prove that this procedure is very simple. So you can just do your resampling. You just apply a test. Uh, this has asymptotic uh, level. Uh, as soon as the test that you are using has pointwise asymptotic level, as soon as you're not resampling too many data points, and as soon as the weights are well behaved, something that also uh, Susan, uh, Susan mentioned. So this gives us a framework that allows us to test these type of statements about invariance uh, in distributions that we have not observed. Um, okay, so this is all what I wanted to say. I'll, uh, I'll skip this and just jump to the, to the conclusions. So in this, in this IID data world, so I try to argue that we have these predictive models um, they usually are the best thing that you want, you can do if the test distribution is the same as the training distribution. Causal models have this property that they are stable with respect to strong interventions on the covariates. Now invariance, this is a link towards causality because in reality, we don't know the causal structure, but you, we can may be able to check for invariance. And this gives us a hint about what causal models are. So the, the hope is, Checking for invariance gives us some models that satisfy this generalizability uh, criterion. Trading off predictability and invariance I haven't talked about. Um, and one, one thing I wanted to just mention as a potential point for discussion is also that generalizability and linearity are actually very closely linked. How much does this generalize to the contextual bandit setting? Well, Without hidden, we believe there's actually no need for using these invariance uh, properties. If hidden exist, we may want to learn these invariant policies because they are indeed some of these guarantees. They hold that um, they generalize better to, to unseen environments. And this motivates testing under distributional shifts. So testing properties for distributions that we don't have data from, which we believe is actually a quite a useful concept um, so maybe some of you have heard about uh, Verma constraints, uh, dormant independencies, all these things you can test, you can construct conditional independence tests and so on. So this is a, a concept that is, we believe, not only useful for this reinforcement learning, but also there. Okay. And with this, uh, I, I close my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank Jonas. You very much. I had I had excuse me I had a question just about uh, some of the 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 uh, core the motivation for for looking at causality under uh, in these situations. One of the 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 kind of general statements we had was that that um, um, you you want causality you you want to do causal reasoning because of the potential for distributional shifts caused by the interventions themselves. You know, often in many situations, the active intervention is is what's breaking the IID assumptions that we would have um, otherwise. Um, and so, I wanted to ask you what happens to the 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 types of setups that you that you presented today when we have that some kind of feedback loop from the action that's being taken back to the initial uh, state um, on some time scale. All right, I, I, I noticed that arrow missing yes, in your graph. Yes, a very good question. I would like to know. So we, <laughs> we, started, with it, we started with this uh, simple setup because it was already uh, challenging enough for us. We, I believe we gained a bit of understanding. Um, and I think it's a very natural uh, or very important question to, to approach. I think so, yes. So the short answer is I don't know. Maybe some, someone else can say something there. It's a, it's a good point. I'm going to ask another question uh, from Adith that is in the Q&A. Um, so let me, actually, maybe I'll ask Adith if he can unmute and ask this. Sure. Uh, thanks, Kat. Hey, Jonas. Uh, that was a very thought-provoking talk. Thanks a lot. Um, I was confused about the observation you had in the contextual bandit case, where you said, if there is no you, then we can just pool the data across the environments and just do it written in as things will work out. And 
like my intuition was that if there is like one environment that's super common then that might drown out signal from the uncommon or rare environments whereas the maximum solution concept might be able to pick up that signal so i was just curious is is this result happening in some asymptotic data regime am i assuming that i'm collecting the same amount of experience from all environments or like what 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 could be going on that's contrary to the intuition yeah thanks uh, that's a, that's a good point as well so the um the point here is this is a population statement um so and you want to um so you may want to think about a situation where you have the same amount of data in each environment. In practice, of course, now if you write down an asymptotic statement, you can also just consider, I guess, the the, the sample size of the, um, the sample size of the smallest environment, for example, going to to infinity. The, however, I think the key insight here is that if you pool the environments, this is this is where there is really a difference to the IID setup. So in the IID setup, we had, for example, using childs of the um, children of the um, of the response variable. This was helping in terms of prediction, but this could mess up your sort of your solution in terms of generalizability. And this doesn't happen here, because um, at least not in this setup, because we don't have any children from the uh, from the reward. So the only thing that can really screw you up are sort of taking into account confounders, um, and then this link via the U sort of changes uh, for different environments. And if you don't have confounders, this can just not happen. So the, the policy that you were you are learning, then is also satisfies also this invariant property. Does this make sense? Yep. Uh, I guess here also there is the realizability assumption happening. Um, uh, yes. As in like, uh, you would you'd assume that the actual reward model or whatever yes, you're yes, like, I yeah, think so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think on the realizability, I, I grant you that. Yeah, then yeah. Thanks, folks. But yeah. I think it also relates to what Emily said earlier, right? That yeah. if now there's a feedback loop, things might also be different. So this, yeah, this uh, result is really about contextual bandits. Yeah. So Thanks. next I wanted to uh, hand it over to Susan to make some remarks and ask a question as well uh, on Genesis talk. Yeah, I mainly want to ask a question. Can you hear me? You can hear yes. me, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, in that, you know, you had that really nice graph with the X1 and the X2 and the A and the R. You remember that graph? Um, I so, can uh, share it once more. right, I appreciate it. Yeah, there it is. So, so right now, of course, U is not really a confounder, right? Because it's not impacting A, it's only impacting R, right? And so, what I, understand you saying is that if I learn a policy, say pi tilde, that you that depends on some x's that for which, I mean, almost all of the x's in real life are connected to R via u's. I mean, let's be, I mean, for the most part, right? These are not mechanistic. So, so are you saying that if I learn a pi tilde that so your second pi was a pi tilde and it used x1 right and this pi tilde now it doesn't it's not it doesn't stably generalize well because of you because you the distribution of you in the next setting might be completely different this is your point yes and in particular so you can even if the environment only x on x1 right uh, the the way how x1 carries information about you that helps me to get a better reward. This might change between different environments. That's right. I'm exactly. not 100% sure. I, I, I got, got the point that U is not influencing A. So the, at least in our setting, so the A is, of course, an action. We need to make it uh, depending on something that we observe, right? But your intuition is right that as soon as if I observe U, then I should better yeah. make it dependent on U, and then I don't have this problem anymore. But this is just a hint, and I'm aware, of course, that this is a very toy scenario, but it's a hint that maybe we can benefit for looking, if you have a bit of heterogeneity in the data already, like a few environments, that it, we could maybe benefit from looking uh, at these invariant statements, because this yeah. is becoming non-trivial as soon as we have uh, these confounders U. So this yeah. is our point. Yeah, so as soon, so if I'm trying to produce a policy that I might want to transfer to another setting, 
I really want to get rid of the influence of X ones. Yes. I'd like to, I just, I don't want my policy to depend on anything like an X one. It should yes, only depend exactly. on things like X twos. Um, exactly. And now, now there's, so if I may say, so now two things maybe, or two thoughts on this. So one is I fully agree with this. And it's, it's even, I think, in, at least interesting that you can ask these questions, right? Even if we have only data from the orange policy, we can still ask these type of questions. Would maybe a policy that only depends on X2 be better in terms of this invariance via this testing framework, testing under distributional shifts? Now, yeah. the, second, the second thought is, and this is even, even further out that uh, yeah, I don't know the answer anymore, but there is this this trade-off between predictability and invariance that I actually um, like, mm -hmm. this is a biased statement, of course, mm -hmm. because it says somewhat, well, maybe the full invariance is a bit too much. And maybe this could be relevant here as well, right? Mm -hmm. Because maybe it could say, well, maybe we can take into account X1 in some way or the other, um, because we see that even though we have some variability in the, between the different environments, it doesn't screw us up entirely. Right, so this, right. This would be the, the idea. So I, this whole talk, though, is all about producing. I mean, if I, if I use a bandit that regret minimizes, I'm not going to be able to do any of your importance weighting unless I really restrict the kind of policies I would want to, any of the alpha policy work I'd want to do. Can, can you say that those, once more? Those importance sense. weights are going to be yeah. really ill-behaved. Yes. Incred unless the numerator kills any kind of ill behaviorness of the denominator, right? Which means I have to restrict the scenarios that I'm interested in. Yeah, or yes, I, I, this I fully agree. And I think the theory, the theory tells us, it gives us a hint, right? Because it, it shows us that the resample should be of size little o of square root of n. Yes. So you can imagine that if you want to have like a test with power, you need a very large sample size. But yes. it at least shows us that maybe you can do something. But I fully agree that uh, this is probably in, in real in real world applications. You want to take this into account already when gathering the data, because if yes. you have some data set that you have to work with, you might run into the, the same the exact problem that you're saying with the uh, ill behaviorness of AIDS. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, and also, if I, if I may say this, uh, what you said earlier, right, it's, it's also a bit of a restricted setting and this, it doesn't solve the problem of saying that you have, you are undersampling a lot, right? So it's just saying, okay, if I understood you correctly, you said earlier that you may have the problem that if you're doing this regret minimization, you have a lot of, you're undersampling some policies that actually may turn out to be important for a different uh, individual. That, or different this, course, outcome yeah yes and this of course we we don't address at all right so the, we are still stuck in this uh, right. in the same uh, same setup we are just trying to say well can we do something with the data that we have yeah. that you have yeah but if i have if i can control my importance weights i can attempt to answer different questions but if my importance weights are ill-behaved which they almost always are if if you regret if you go for regret minimization Anyway, I'm going to end on that. Kill regret minimization. <laughs> so maybe following up on, on some of these comments about the sort of trade-off between invariance and predict, uh, prediction, uh, I was curious. Uh, it makes sense if for someone who only cares about prediction, so let's say regret minimization, that one would like try to for for the purposes of generalization, like try to regularize with something to to promote promote generalization. I was also wondering. So that's from the perspective of uh, like predictive performance. What about from the so maybe let's talk about from the perspective of causality or from uh, generalizable knowledge. I don't know if this is quite the right uh, wording. Like, what does it mean to trade off? invariance with you know something that's not uh like not invariant what does that what does that mean what is that what is the interpretation of that is that is it still um you know is a almost invariant model it's no longer invariant right so what is it what does it mean i think this is directed mostly to jonas but maybe susan you can add on as well 
I, I can say something maybe. So you're right that if you say, so sort of this is the nice thing about duality, right? So you can write it in both ways. So we can say we're looking for the best predictive model such that invariance is sort of uh, satisfied, right? Um, or we can uh, sort of do it the other way around. And there's there's one, I'm not sure whether you like this answer, but there's there's one interesting connection that we, you think it's interesting that we found to, um, if, if you have instrumental variable models and you're looking at, let's say two stage least squares, you find that the two stage least square solution is actually has very bad statistical properties. Now, um, there is a, this is very old uh, econometrics uh, literature and they are so-called K-class estimators. And they have this idea that you are not sort of um, looking at the two stageless, uh, two stageless squares solution that just optimizes invariance period, but you are trading this off with uh, the OLS. And there, I would say you're actually doing it the other way around, right? So you're focusing on invariance because this gives you the identifiability. And then you are in introducing this predictability for statistical uh, performance gains. So I'm not sure whether this is the answer that you're looking for, but this is what has been done. And these perform much better in practice than just using two stage with squares. Can I ask uh, one question to Susan? Um, because the sort of once more regarding this undersampling, I mean, I see this point, but now sort of moving forward, how would one do it? Because there are, of course, also a lot of actions that are undersampled that you never actually want to try out because they are bad for, let's say, all individuals or all outcomes. So what is sort of how can where do we get sort of an idea of our, what is the information we can try to exploit to to get an idea about which uh, things we should uh, keep being undersampled and which one we should sample a bit more? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question because well in the world I live in you can't have very many actions there's just too much noise you're not going to learn. So what you end up doing is you group the actions and so you end up with like three groups of actions and they differ grossly in terms of burden they place on the individual. So I only try and discriminate differences within a group you it's just randomly chosen the action is ch randomly chosen. So we only look at policies that try to learn which of the three groups of actions mm -hmm. should be selected. And they're very distinct. They're expected to have a distinct solution. And there the idea, we, our, the idea we have is we should, we should think of some sort of allocation instead of trying to get, we should think of an allocation, a smooth, like the limiting policy, the optimal policy is highly um, discontinuous. If you think of it in the, as a stochastic policy, it, the limit is a deterministic policy. So that limit is a dis, discontinuous limit of that smooth, a stochastic policy. Um, and what we're thinking is you should decide ahead of time that uh, based on certain things, it's gonna have to be some sort of constrained problem that you'll have a limiting allocation. And this idea has been, was developed long, long time ago in, in old, old clinical trials in stage one, stage two clinical trials, this idea of a limiting allocation. Um, it, I don't know if that's really answering your question, but the idea is that you want the best, you wanna, you have a space of limiting allocations and you want the best within that space, but they're all smooth. They're not, they're not uh, discrete. They're no longer deterministic policies. Yeah. If I can ask a follow up. So my question was also hinting at the fact that whether it could be possible if you have, let's say, several individuals already, you may get an idea about what kind of action, at least for this, these individuals were undersampled if you just do regret minimization. Is there any way to exploit this information? I personally, I haven't seen a way. What we do is okay. we look at the end of the study and we get rid of actions yes, then. Yeah. Yeah. which is actually more similar to what's done in old classical adaptive clinical trials in the clinical trials literature is they have planned looks at the data. Like after the study has been going on three months, they look at the data and they get rid of some of the actions. And usually it's chemotherapies or something like that. Here it's with, for, in digital health, it's more between batches of data. 
we get rid of actions because they're not performing well, but it's not in a smooth online way. Do it. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe building on this point, um, I was wondering, so there's one idea in off policy evaluation, uh, actually some work from our colleagues at MSR uh, on doubly robust estimation in, uh, for off policy evaluation uh, for contextual bandits as well as for reinforcement learning. So the idea behind that is, well, important sampling based estimators suffer from these variance issues from under sampling, uh, like Susan uh, has mentioned. Uh, so instead, potentially you can trade it off with a model uh, the models fit on the data as well, uh, but and it may have some bias, but uh, potentially much lower variance. So you can sort of trade these off. So one thing I was thinking is um, uh, whether there's so you know this is uh, so this is a model that's fit on the data, uh, and the uh, the invariance. Uh, so it has nothing to do with invariance, but let's try to think about it from the perspective of invariances. Uh, potentially, potentially, you can think of this as like, do I trust, uh, do I trust like my current data, or do I trust the model, and sort of trading off between these two. If I have data close, or if my situation is close to where I have data, then maybe I want to like trust the data, and if I don't, maybe I want to trust the model. And this model now, like, let's consider, you know, this is maybe naive thinking, but let's consider like instead of the model learned from the data, let's consider that to be like an invariant model. Now, uh, I'm curious, does that, um, you know, could that help overcome some of the undersampling issues where, okay, if I don't, if I do have data, uh, then I have, you know, if I have sampled enough, then I use the samples, I use my importance weights. If I don't, then maybe I, you know, the best I can do is trust some invariant model where I, you know, I'm, I'm extrapolating in some sense anyway. So I'm curious what our, um, what our, uh, speakers think of that. I, the, I think even if I, I think I know which papers you're speaking about, but I may be wrong, but I do think the theory required that the importance weights are bounded, the limiting theory. So any time, yeah. So it's still, it's not like, so I'd have to just completely give up on the, I just have to go with the model man and extrapolate. I mean, from a theoretical perspective. Um, so like any kind of mixing of the model with the data where the, in a setting in which the importance weights are really ill behaved, it's just, it seems to me it's gonna really cause trouble. Uh, and the theory that I've seen, at least in papers, always says the weights, the importance weights are bounded. It assumes the importance weights are bounded. Do you know anything, Jonas, about this, like in, in other settings? Uh, no, I don't think I have, I have much to, to add. There's one thing that I'm thinking about, but uh, we, we will investigate maybe a bit, is that because the in this resampling, what we are right, what we are doing is we are resampling uh, distinct values. So if you have extremely large weights, you may get this sample, uh, this observation in into this resample once, but never twice by construction because we are resampling distinct. Uh, this is a bit like resampling with replacement, but making yeah. sure that the the sample that you get is distinct. So I'm actually now curious whether this is slightly less sensitive to these badly, uh, badly behaved weights, but uh, we also, I, I think we have a second moment bound as well. So, but maybe we, we investigate it's a good comment. And maybe then these, these things could even help, but don't yeah, This idea is so interesting, the resampling according to the importance weights. I think that's quite interesting. Well, the, the resampling has been done, uh, of course, uh, um, before, but I think it's, so we, we believe that it's interesting for in this testing procedure yeah. uh, because this is a way that at least for us was key to think about this this problem yeah. mm -hmm. i have a i have a question about uh for both both of you jonas and, and susan about some of about what you think is the big the the you know bigger kind of 
opportunities for uh, um, you know, developing these algorithms and applying them in, in real world uh, contexts. I'm, I'm thinking about the potential benefits of the, the kind of work that you're doing. And, and I think about it in terms of a few different things that it might enable. And I'm curious which of these are something else entirely is, is motivating you in the, in the short or, or long term. One is that as uh, obviously, you know, learning the optimal policy faster is, is, is better. It's going to get us, you know, uh, uh, let us make fewer mistakes and, and, and make better decisions more quickly. A second is that, you know, with the type of formalisms and understanding of, of the underlying me mechanisms here, we can develop algorithms that let us apply these decision-making um, strategies in more and more complex scenarios where it's harder to reason about things manually um, and, and we'll just be able to extend these types of automated decisions into scenarios where we couldn't have hoped to deal with the complexity uh, before. A, a third is, is actually, I think, connected to something you said, Susan, about the limitations of the actions that we can consider. And that is, what, what, what can we do? Can we develop much better outcomes if we are able to explore or, or reason about a much richer, higher dimensional action space specifically um, um, in order to find new kind of uh, uh, optimal operating points? I, I'm curious, and these are just the three, obviously there's others like you know scientific knowledge. What, how do you think about the benefits of the work that you're doing? Huh? Feel free to tell me that was not a great question. <laughs> you want to go first? Yeah, I think mine is shorter. <laughs> so I should really say that, I mean, we are only looking into this problem uh, since recently. So we, we have much less experience with real data than, than other people have. Um, and I, I think what, so what I believe uh, regarding this, this putting in, let's say, structural knowledge. So in, my, in our experience from the IAD world, I'm not so sure I believe in that we have a real world problem where we can just write down a directed acyclic graph over 20 variables. And then this is a good model for the real world situation. This is, of course you can do it and it's maybe a model and hopefully not entirely useless, but in, in our experience it's quite far away from a lot of, uh, from the real data world generating process. So having these, these smaller questions like invariance uh, this is, was turning out for us a bit helpful because then you are not tr even trying to model this full causal yeah. thing about uh, 200 variables, but you are focusing on one little thing that is also a bit closer to reality because you can try to test for it. So this is what something that we realized in the IAD world that uh, seemed to make a difference in the real world applications we were looking at. Whether this will also make a difference or would in the real reinforcement learning world, I just don't know because we have too little experience, but it would be we are curious to see. But now Susan has more experience, so she can say uh, say more, I guess. Well, I, 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 think the, I think there's a feedback loop, right, by looking at the real world. Um, we know that most, for example, whereas, I mean, there is some work in non-stationary, with tracking non-stationarity in RL, but it's absolutely, it, it seems to me this is like the biggest divide between theory in RL and practice in RL. Practice in RL is a non-stationary world. Uh, and you see like in uh, a lot of these stochastic gradient type methods, they, they never, the learning rate, they don't let it decrease to zero, for example, in practice, even though theoretically it should decrease at a certain rate to get convergence. Um, so um, there's this feedback. That's what I really like is the feedback loop with the real world setting. Um, I do think, I personally think that there is really a chance that I think RL can make an enormous difference in digital health if you work with big team, you know, if you're willing to work in big teams with people who can uh, develop high quality action spaces that can reason about the causal, the mechanistic structure um, and take, it, take into account the domain science. Um, I, I think we're going to see, this is what I 
this is my prediction. I think we're going to see, and we, we already see a little bit of this, but not completely, not fully with the RL, is that not only will there be different types of interventions, like there'll be an intervention to help you manage your weight, there'll be an intervention, uh, you know, in your, your app, you'll have an intervention to help you manage your weight. Uh, so I'm thinking of people who had like bariatric surgery. So they were morbidly obese, they had this surgery, now they want to really stay on you know, for the rest of their life, they don't want to regain weight. They have to control their stress. They have to uh, manage their weight and uh, they have to exercise. I mean, and they really want to because they don't want to have to have another surgery. I mean, this is bad. Uh, so it's it, consistent with their goals, but you have three really distinct objectives. So, and you can have interventions that target all of those and they're kind of bundled together. In RL, I think we're going to have another component, which is an algorithm, which helps to personalize those uh, decision-making algorithm that personalizes those different intervention parts, the, the one about healthy eating, stress management, and physical activity, and also manages how they interact with each other. Uh, I really see, I think this is going to have, I, I feel really confident that we can, we can do this. Uh, and it partially is due to my collaborators, right? I see this coming. Thank you. I did want to ask a follow-up question uh, from Susan, your, your talk earlier about uh, this tension between generalizable knowledge and the idiosyncratic uh, objective. Um, so I think your argument is that these should be considered simultaneously, or at least some domains uh, have both um, as characteristics, and I'm wondering how uh, how you know can we? Uh, I'm I'm curious about your perspective as to like why they are like if they are really interlinked, or is it is it that it would be great if we could answer both questions simultaneously, or is there something that can only be answered by uh, by addressing? the two together. And part of the motivation for my question is that in, in some other domains, let's say, so I do a lot of work in mobility where uh, a, a lot of the procedures are, well, there are like sort of two ingredients. There, there is an element of human behavior uh, and, and there's physics, like how yeah. your cars move and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so physics, we understand very well. So we sort of got the generalizable knowledge like decades ago, and now we can use it here. And, and also we do this to some extent, or the community does this to some, some extent with human behavior, where a lot of studies are done, a lot of surveys, a lot of to understand like, how do people choose routes and how do they pick their modes and how do they, are they gonna buy a vehicle and, and whatnot. And so these are done separately. And then there are models for which one can do some kind of sequential decision-making. And those are, these are separate. I'm curious, you know, how is it, is it specific, is it, um, is it, you know, how do you think about whether they should be together or 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 separate? Yeah, I've, so I've always thought they should be together because there's these. Um, I mean, I I did speak of I I used the test bed of a contextual bandit, but these are not contextual bandit settings. There are very poorly understood delayed effects of these actions. Um, the biggest signal usually is. Uh, burden and habituation. People just don't see the notifications anymore. And then there's other types of delayed effects. And um, if so by doing separate and you have that combined with a setting, you might hopefully think you, we just don't know what we should measure. We have all these unknown unknowns. And so we can do these small studies and they inform the design of a sequential experimentation trial. It's not like you don't do all the other studies. You still, but I, I don't think you can do them in a non time varying setting. You know, so like one, you can cross sectionally look at, oh, we'll do, you know, how, um, like when people choose, you know, there's all kinds of studies where you can just do cross sectional studies and you ask people their opinion and then you get an idea about what to do. But that's not the case here. Often people don't even have an experience with these types of suggestions. They don't even know how they'll respond to it. 
Uh, so asking them won't work. You need to look over time and see at what point, what kinds of shocks occur and occur that make them drop off and disengage. Um, I, I, I value greatly all the other work that can go around that goes around and informs the whole environment in which uh, the, the sequential experimentation is designed, but I don't see that it replaces the sequential experimentation. I think that's a, yeah, I think that's a great take. Yeah. Uh, Adia has a question. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, it was prompted by Susan's remarks actually on non-stationarity and learning effects. Like. Uh, I'm trying to frame the question. So it, it really feels like we can potentially frame this uh, problem of uh, sequential decision-making as a, as a bandit, as a longer horizon RL problem, but all of these seem to be um, ignoring some important facets of the real world problem. Uh, take the example of habituation, for example, right? So uh, especially in the education setting, I know that my artificial learner is actually interacting with a human learner. And um, it's not even clear to me that I can represent what the human learner is getting out of it, like these outcomes as like a, like a reward, even like a time index reward as a function of state and actions. Um, and, and I wonder if we should be framing these problems not as policies, but more like mechanisms and like the algorithmic game theory literature, or, or do we think that there is like a natural ramp going from bandits, whether they be causal or not, all the way up to reasoning about like multi-party marketplaces with strategic agents each having their own learning behaviors that's that's a great question and i i don't know if this is even halfway decent answer but a lot of the the interventions or the little nudges are about helping you change your utility function your value system so this idea that somehow that a person's value system is somehow, I mean, I'm not talking about value system in a broad sense. I'm talking about whether or not you see yourself say as someone who exercises, this is sort of, this is like a value system. And a lot of the nudges are trying to help you adopt that viewpoint that you see your, that you start to value exercise. Uh, are that you recognize or to help you recognize that you value exercise. So uh, modeling humans, somehow most of the work I see is we act as if humans come to us and they have their whole utility function preformed and, and, and they're optimizing their utility function. We got to optimize ours and we got to kind of have a, a reach an equilibrium. But I don't think it's like that at all. I think a lot of individuals are not even, their utility function is, constantly changing um, and it's and it can be uh altered uh and helping the and also sometimes they're not aware of it and if you bring it to their attention you have to there are special you know ways that one attempts to do that then they value it more because it's more so it, it's it seems to me it's um i'm i'm just not sure about the uh multiplayer type scenario um yeah that's a wonderful answer though like, yeah, yeah it, it even boggles my mind how I can even represent these influenceable utility functions in the kinds of causal graphs, like for example, what Jonas showed, right? Or even in the classical templates that we have for MDPs or CVs or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think my favorite parts of these discussions so far have been some of these points highlighting concepts that we don't yet have a handle on. Um, whether it's, you know, the feedback loops and, you know, how delayed or delayed effects to, um, you know, how, how to think about manipulable utility functions. It seems like there's a, a lot, quite a lot um, here that, that you know, we don't yet have a, a language or a formalist, certainly formalisms for. Mm -hmm. 
What do you on um, on, on that as causality and reinforcement learning come together? Are there places that you're looking at to try and borrow concepts in particularly useful ways that where you know to, to fill some of these uh, uh, these gaps? I know it's you know <laughs> Jonas. I think I'm pointing towards Joh Jonas. He's to the left of me. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe I can I can say so. The what we also saw. Okay, so when this idea of like causality in reinforcement learning, this of course a lot of people are thinking about this, and it it sounds very appealing. So my take on this is really to to try to think very carefully about where could it make a difference. Because there are many scenarios, I think, where it cannot. And this is also what we try to, to say a bit, like if you don't have hidden in this particular setup, for example, then causality just doesn't help. There's there's one thing that um, we, where we also saw that it makes a difference. Um, it's a bit of a trivial thought, uh, a trivial thing, but it's actually quite useful in practice. If you know something about the causal structure that lets you sort of redefine your weights, uh, then this is something that uh, where causality, I think, really uh, helps in reinforcement learning from a finite sample perspective. So what was the example? This is, we did this actually at Microsoft Research uh, many years ago with, with Leon Botu, where sort of, it was an optimization problem where you basically have a continuous parameter that you play with. And then you realize that the effect this continuous parameter has on sort of the outcome, let's say on the reward, actually always goes causally via a discrete random variable. Um, so this was something to do with the advertisements and that uh, you only see the outcome, the mainline reserve is a continuous parameter, but you only see the outcome uh, of how many ads there are. So this is a discrete variable. And th then this is a very concrete way of sort of exploiting causal knowledge because then you can redefine your weights uh, in these uh, sort of inverse probability weighting and you get much better performance because of the reduced variance because you don't have to deal with sort of weights using a continuous density, but rather you can use weights constructed by a PMF. So this is a very concrete way of using causal knowledge. We try to now in, in this way, we, in this invariance work, we are also trying to see, okay, what exactly, where exactly can causality benefit? And, and then trying to, to see whether this makes a difference in, in practice or not. But I think it's not everywhere. So if you have, like, if you are restricted to, a, to the setting of, I don't know, the, let's say, um, um, you have an IRD setting and so on, and you can try whatever you like, you have infinitely many data, then it's just also important, I think, to say here causality doesn't help. I think that's at least for us helpful in our thought process to try to identify where has where is their potential. Thanks so much uh, for that for that answer, Johannes. That was a great answer. I um, I think we're we're getting close to the the end of our two hours actually, so the time went by quite quickly. Um, so I wanted to ask if you, uh, Susan, uh, Jonas, have any last words you'd like to share, um, 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 and as we wrap up, maybe I can start. So um, I think it could be could be nice to sort of see some somewhat. Uh, real world challenges that are very close to real world problems where one can then try to see whether these ideas of causality and let's say this is not an IID world problem uh, and let's say we, we are looking for um, adaptation uh, and then see whether sort of the methods one can think of make a difference or not because this is something that we realized or we learned from in, in, in the IID world of causality that it's really the real world applications sort of that drives, in my opinion, that drives our research field towards the relevant assumptions. Because if you are sitting down and just writing down identifiability statements for a, a causality, then it, there's really a risk that we are moving very far into a theoretical corner that doesn't have anything to do with real world uh, life uh, processes. And this is about assumptions, right? And maybe one last comment why I think this is so important. If you're just interested in IID prediction, then of course, in a way, we could say these assumptions don't matter because we can always check on, let's say, 
let's say via uh, via training a predictive model and then we have some model assumptions we could also say maybe these model assumptions are wrong but i would say there it doesn't matter that much because we can always help out 20 percent of the data and then see whether this uh, whether our predictive model works well or not on the 20 percent help out uh, 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 observations we cannot do this in causality as easily so therefore i think this this connection to real world uh, applications is even more important and maybe it would be nice to to see maybe these exist already and then you can tell me but to see these uh, causality reinforcement type challenges i think That's um fantastic. well yeah the the points i would make just follow straight from jonas's points it's what how do you figure out the right abstraction you can't i mean the real life problem is too messy it's and and half of the things you can just uh do little ad hoc corrections for you know you don't have to but what are the what abstractions can of the real life problem can you use to then provide some underlying principle approach and um this is where i mean that was the point of my whole little discussion was that regret minimization i think needs some work here it's the wrong abstraction it needs it needs more uh, needs to be improved, and like Jonas said, uh, having some way where you have these individuals who are working more on applied and theoretical, and have some way so that they can you can figure out what the right abstractions are or the best. I don't want to say right; that's not right. Uh, the best abstractions or the most useful abstractions in order to try solve to solve theoretically. This would be really nice. Um, Well, thank you so much for those closing words. Um, I you know I had a lot of, of fun listening to this panel and hearing about your both of your perspectives on this intersection between causality and sequential decision making. I really appreciate uh, both of you taking the time uh, uh, to be here today. Um, Kathy, uh, are there any yeah. closing words you'd like to say? I learned a ton. And uh, I really enjoy seeing the connection points between the theory and the real world um, applications. And uh, I, can, I can foresee it leading to new research, which is always very exciting. Uh, so I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna end the main session and we're going, we have a few minutes remaining. So anyone who'd like to have a sort of closer uh, conversation for the, uh, for the next like eight minutes or so, uh, can feel free to stay on. Um, and so uh, let's all give a huge round of applause uh, to Jonas and Susan for excellent talks and remarks. It was a pleasure. So somebody in the chat put this abstract of a paper about penalties people pay. What was that about? I don't. Um, I saw that. I couldn't. Uh, I didn't yeah, remember. I, I, I linked to it, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that was me. Um, I did research on the value of data, especially for the predictive value of data, and then uh, the time dependency and its effect on, uh, on the value that's been created, like the business value. Uh, we looked at the next prediction problem and then we used like in a Baidu server to run things and we measured like how the value of data decays with a new measure that we like, defined on the paper it was the effectiveness of a data, like you know, a data set. And we measured it based on the size of a data set, like how the size changes, the required size to, to achieve a certain error level, like you know, changes over time. And uh, the surprising thing was that for the text report, for the next word prediction task, like after seven years, the value of data just becomes half. Interesting. Which was to your point, uh, like regarding these things, um, like um, the distribution shift, well, in general, but. Uh, not just that, like the, the penalty that people pay 
for like a resampling and then how to like adjust weights and stuff, how important it is. I had a general observation or just a question to Susan, like how do people tune hyperparameters in these bandit algorithms in practice? Oh gosh. <laughs> you and have then I was wondering feet. if you <laughs> it wonder is... if causality will help. That's the most I wonder. Thing. I should think about that. I mean, I would need some help, Jonas. But uh, I'm t it is so hard. Well, there's the computational problem as well, like because this is online. It has to be extremely stable. And if you're pooling uh, data across individuals online, the computational problem is massive to try and tune. Like if you're doing Gaussian processes and you want to tune the kernel parameters, or if you're just doing regular linear regression, it's Bayesian, and you want to update um, covariances, or if you have random effects and you want to update their variances, it's just horrendous. The computational burden is horrendous. Um, Right, so we, we have one study where we used um, empirical bays to tune hyperparameters, you know, type two ML, that's what people call it, MLA type two. And it was, we had to uh, have the update times be very far apart because the computational burden was so, so high. Um, Could you also comment, I was wondering uh, with the, when you're doing these trials with a single um, a single participant, it's so little data as compared to what we typically see in like empirical reinforcement learning. So yeah. I was wondering, I know, yeah, it, maybe it's more of a bandit setting, so maybe that makes a difference, but I'm curious like how, how you overcome, like, I mean, even right. compared to web advertising, it's much, much less data. Yeah. So I'm curious how, how you can do anything. Right, so, uh, uh, running a series of trials is critical. Each trial sets the prior for the next oh, trial. Okay. Right, that's critical. And then, so right now, the we have been running the algorithms, uh, and so, and also we knew there were delayed effects, but we the data so noisy we couldn't do full or we didn't feel that we could do full or else. So we had like a bias term mm -hmm. to, that we added in the. Thompson sampling to try and anticipate the delayed effects. And we built that bias term on prior, from prior data. Um, uh, I think really going forward, we have to pull, pull data across users in, time, in real time. But this causes enormous problems if you wanna do generalize, if you wanna to contribute to generalizable knowledge, because when the study's over, your users are no longer independent. Mm -hmm. And so how do you analyze that data? Now, the dependence is highly structured. It's only through the actions, right? And you know that. You controlled completely the dependence. So you should be able to manage it. Uh, that's a really interesting. That's something I can, I'm very interested in right now, is how do, you, how, do you how do you have an algorithm that pulls over many users in real time? It has to do it stably without a, a, you know, we can't, these are trials. So you can't go and fiddle with the algorithms. You, you, everything gets protocolized and you try and stay as close to that protocol as, par, as much as possible. But anyway, um, yeah. So there's a lot of things you want to, you need, it needs to be a very stable algorithm. You'd like to learn faster. So you want to pool over people and you want to assess similarities in some way between people. So you know to the degree to which the pooling is, but then you want to do analyses after the study's over in order to set up the next trial and to gain more knowledge. But you have to, so you have to figure out how to do that when you induce dependence between your people. I think that's also very 